So tonight we're looking at the American Jewish landscape. And I think the best way to do that is to take you through a study that was done about eight years ago by the Pew Forum on Religion and American Life. It's called A Portrait of Jewish Americans. And I was all excited to take you through this study until I got an email this week that said, guess what? The 2020 Pew study is coming out next week. <laughs> so all of the numbers I'm gonna quote for you tonight and show you are going to be moot in a week <laughs> because they're gonna release the new version of the numbers. But if nothing else, the new numbers are probably going to be derived in the similar way the old numbers were. And if nothing else, getting a sense of where American Jewish life was in 2013 will give you a good way to understand where it is now in 2021 when we get updated numbers. You'll understand the categories and what the issues were they were focused on. And sometimes it's very interesting what issues they focus on and what issues they don't focus on, what issues they present and what issues they sort of hide in the data. Okay, so the first question you always have to ask when people are telling you about what they know about American Jewish life is, how do you know it? Did you just sort of talk to your neighbors and decide that's what American Jews are like? Did you do some studies? Do you interview people? If so, how did you find them? How did you define who's Jewish? And one of the nice things about this Pew study is they were very um, transparent about how they got their numbers, what the questions they asked were, and what their methodology was. So here at the very bottom of the opening page, they describe who they interviewed. They actually called 70,000 people uh, to identify Jewish respondents in all 50 states. They wound up doing longer interviews that were completed with 3,400 Jews, um, including 2,700 Jews by religion and 689 Jews of no religion. And we'll have a chance to see a little bit more about what they mean by those. And there were also about 1,100 non-Jews of Jewish background as they defined it, and about 467 of people who, called, uh, who they considered Jewish affinity. But one of the, I think, stumbling blocks to understanding um, any study of Jewish American life is the perennial question that they also start with in the Pew study, which is, who is a Jew? Because if you want to count what Jews are and what the Jewish community is like, you have to define who's in and who's out. Now, you could follow the most restrictive definition, try to find out if their mother is Jewish or not, and then only count people in that population. But as many demographers will tell you, you'll be leaving out a large number of people who self-identify as Jewish, maybe because they have one parent who's Jewish who's their father, or they've done a genetic test and identify as Jewish because they found they have Jewish genes, or who knows what their background is, or they converted to being Jewish um, by a reform congregation as opposed to an Orthodox congregation. Who do you recognize? In the end, most demographers will go with this self-identification metric and be candid about the fact of letting people self-identify. But what Pew did that was interesting is they actually broke it down into uh, a flow chart of how they put the people into different categories. So imagine how you would answer these questions if you got a survey person calling you. And I will say at the outset, there's a real challenge in doing phone surveys, surveys these days for a couple of reasons. One is phone surveys are based on a reality where people are A, at home with a home phone line, B, will answer that phone line, and C, we'll spend time talking to the person on that phone line that they don't know, and D, we'll tell the truth to people on that phone line they don't know that they're spending all this time talking to. We know that many households no longer have landlines, and so that may skew the data into an older population if you're only talking to landlines. Um, and we know that people are less likely to give time to surveys, and so you actually have to talk to a lot of people before you get people who will complete the survey, and they don't want to use partial survey results because that skews the later questions in the survey. So doing surveys itself is a really hard business. I don't envy them at all. I'm very interested to see the methodology section in the 2020 version because these trends have only accelerated about not answering the phone and not talking to strangers, and not telling the truth, and not even having a landline to begin with. So the first question they asked is, are you Jewish by religion? And if you said a yes or a no, there were different options. If you said yes, they countered you in their category of Jews by religion. If you said no to are you Jewish by religion, they would say, were you raised Jewish or did you have a Jewish parent? The answer is yes. They'd say, what's your religion today? I'm not religious. I don't have a religion. Then they would say, well, aside from religion, do you consider yourself to be Jewish or partly Jewish? Yes. Then they fit in the category of 
Jews of no religion. But if they said no, then they were people of Jewish background. So may have another religion, maybe no religion, but they don't self-identify as Jewish, they're of Jewish background. Now, if they were not Jewish by religion and not raised Jewish and did not have a Jewish parent, do they consider themselves Jewish or partly Jewish? That's people with a Jewish affinity. You know, maybe they were always attracted to Jewish culture or they did a genetic test and decided they're connected to being Jewish that way. They're Jewish affinity, but not self-identifying as Jewish. And that's how they tried to break down the population. Answers. Uh, what kind of Jew are you? Well, it turns out that 22% of American Jews as a whole, as of 2013, identified as Jews of no religion. 78% said they were Jews by religion, based on that flow chart. But notice the age breakdown of the older generations, overwhelming over 80%, including baby, baby boomers, define their Jewishness as Jews by religion, but fully a third of millennials define themselves as not religious. When answer, asked, are you Jewish by religion? They said, no. Were you raised Jewish? Do you have a Jewish parent? Yes. Do you consider yourself Jewish in some way? Yes. That's that 32% among those millennials. And they asked them as well, what is being Jewish about mainly? And notice the numbers that said it's mainly about ancestry and culture are the overwhelming majority, even the majority of Jews who define themselves as Jewish by religion. Very few Jews of any category said Jewishness is mainly a matter of religion. They were much more likely to say it's a matter of religion or a, com a, re a religion, ancestry, and culture combined, or simply a question of ancestry and culture. Obviously, Jews of no religion were more likely to say Jewishness was a question of um, ancestry and culture. And so here we have some general demographics of American Jews. And this is one of those cases where you can see the demographers putting their thumb on the scale. So they want to talk about Jewish demographics, things like how old is the Jewish community? What is their economic profile? Where do they live? What's the number one topic they put in this chapter? Intermarriage. Are Jews marrying Jews or are Jews marrying people who aren't Jewish? That's been a demographic obsession in some ways of the American Jewish community for many generations, unfortunately. And, um, you know, sometimes the results are the opposite of what they want, because you get people paranoid about intermarriage. And then when somebody does marry someone not Jewish, they're pushed away from the Jewish community when they could, in fact, be encouraged to stay connected. But notice how the numbers have changed historically. For those respondents who were married before 1970, 83% of them had a Jewish spouse and even more so those who identified as Jewish by religion. But notice how the numbers shift as you get into more recent years. By those married in the 1990s or the 2000s, you have fully over 50% of those whose spouse uh, is not Jewish. Um, and even among Jews who identify their Jewishness as religion, around 50% uh, their spouses are not Jewish, 45, 50%, depending on the cohort. Um, so that's a substantial change in the American Jewish community. And notice that that can have all kinds of ripple effects in terms of what it means to be Jewish, how you define your Jewishness, what kind of communities are popular in the Jewish community. And we'll see that very much so uh, the reform movement has grown, for example, because of the relative openness to intermarried families compared to the conservative or the orthodox world, although they have their own demographic challenges. So notice the intermarriage by religious denomination. Of those who are currently married, 98% of those who say they are Orthodox, their spouse is Jewish. Again, that's currently Orthodox. Um, but still about a quarter of conservative Jews have a non-Jewish spouse and fully 50% of Reformed Jews have a spouse who is not Jewish. And so what does it mean to say you're part of the tribe when it's a marriage question and not an ancestry question? What does it mean to make jokes in Yiddish at a, a congregational event when a good chunk of your audience may not have any ancestral connection to that language, let alone the Jews who do not speak Yiddish for any number of reasons. They could be from German Jewish backgrounds or Sephardic Mizrahi Jews, uh, or they could simply have not been born Jewish and have joined the Jewish family by marriage. Now, I find the age question, of course, that's a basic demographic question. Why aren't they starting with that? <laughs> but they wanted to start with intermarriage. So you notice some interesting things about the age distribution of Jewish adults. The general U.S. public, 22% are 18 to 29, and Jews, 20% are 18 to 20. Okay, so that seems to make sense. But notice, 
For Jews by religion, it's slightly less, and Jews of no religion are, again, weighted toward that younger cohort. Um, Middle-aged uh, Jews are 28% compared to 34% for the overall population. And then the older populations are somewhat higher among Jews. So 13% of Jews are 65 to 74 or were eight years ago, whereas 11% of the general population and 11% of Jews are 75 plus compared to 7% of the general population. But when you put those together, the 65 plus cohort all the way up, you got 24% of Jews are 65 plus, so that's a full quarter, whereas 18% or about a fifth of the American Jewish general pop uh, population is over 65. So that's why you notice the median age for adults is going to be somewhat higher for Jews at 50 for Jews as a whole, a little bit higher for those who identify as Jewish by religion. Notice conservative Jews are the highest median age of all the groups, uh, where Orthodox is somewhat lower at 40. In fact, it's the lowest almost of all the groups except for Hispanic Catholics, which are also of a median age of 40. But uh, evangelical Protestants, 53. Uh, mainline Protestants, 52. They're all sort of a little bit older than Jews, but not that much in that 50-year-old uh, age range. Notice the unaffiliated median age is 37. Younger people are much more secular than the older ones. And the fertility rate, again, is not going to be a surprise. Jews as a whole are about 1.9. Uh, uh, average number of children born per adult, where the general public is 2.2. Uh, but Orthodox Jews are 4.1, where Reform and Conservative are more like 1.8, 1.7. Uh, this that shouldn't be shocking. Um, in terms of the household size, again, generally Jews are in a 2.2 uh, person per household. Uh, they don't have a comparison to the general population, but again, Orthodox are a little bit larger. Nothing uh, radical here. This is also fascinating when you talk about demographics of the American Jewish community, and that is education and earnings. Again, why isn't this higher up than intermarriage on the list? But these numbers are really stark in comparison to the general population. So the general US public, only 29% is a college graduate compared to 58% of American Jews. Um, whereas 42% of the general population has a high school degree or less, where only 17% of the American Jewish population has this. Notice as well, when you combine the high school or less and some college, which means didn't finish college, didn't get a degree, 42% of American Jews, uh, is that right? No, 30, yeah, 42% of American Jews have high school or some college, but 71% of the general population has high school or some college. Think now about the dynamics of political issues like college debt forgiveness, for example. That 42% has no interest in college debt forgiveness because they didn't go to college. So again, when we're trying to understand our neighbors, trying to understand the American uh, place in the, uh, sorry, the Jewish place in the American landscape, these kind of numbers are really important to understand why our priorities may be different from other population groups. Also notice the question of household income. Household income 150,000 or higher, fully 25% of American Jews, one quarter, earn 150,000 or more compared to 8% for the general population. On the bottom end, there are still one fifth of American Jews, 20%. Many of them seniors earn less than $30,000 a year compared to a full third, 36% of the general US population. So uh, American Jewish earnings is skewed upward. Same if you combine the top two. If you added 150,000 plus and the 100 to 149,000, you're talking 42% of the American Jewish population earning 100,000 or more compared to 18% of the general population. Education and income combined. Well, here we again have, notice the breakout by Jews by religion or Jews of no religion. Notice, by the way, only 39% of the Orthodox American Jews are college graduates compared to 60 plus percent of Reform and Conservative Jews. Uh, so again, the the splits within the Jewish community also begin to become clear in terms of fertility rates, in terms of income levels. Notice the income levels, 150,000 plus income, 28% of the Orthodox Jews, but 37% of modern Orthodox Jews. So that's a split even within that community. Um, and a, a higher number of Reform Jews have that higher income compared to conservative or non-denominational Jews. Again, comparing it to the general population or other religious groups, it's very striking 
the emphasis on college education and the resultant higher incomes that are available. Um, employment and not employed again, uh, you'll see similar kind of results. Are you immigrants or born here? For Jews, 86% were born in the US compared to 83% of the general population. And 14% of Jews were born outside versus 70%. Again, relatively comparable, but a good chunk of those Jews born um, outside of the US are former Soviet Jews, which are about 5% of the Jewish population, some from Europe and some from Canada, Mexico, and about 2% coming from Israel uh, to the US. Uh, whereas the America's number is much higher for the general population, obviously that's the uh, Hispanic Latino born uh, population, plus some Canadians seeking their way in too. Um, one of the more contentious issues is the question of race and uh, Jewish identity. Um, there's been some debates in the last few years over whether this undercounted Jews of color. And there are a number of factors and arguments about that. That'll be one of the interesting details to focus on in the new study coming out in the next week or so. Um, and that is what proportion of the American Jewish population identify as uh, black or Hispanic or some other kind of non-white identity uh, compared to so-called white Jews. Um, and you'll notice again, it's a much larger proportion than the general public in this survey who identified as white, but even the highest numbers that you'll find in these surveys um, uh, and studies of uh, statistical data are 10%, maybe 15% Jews of color, uh, still 85% not Jews of color compared to the general population, which is simply getting more and more uh, pigment, pigmentated. I don't know if that's a word, but you get the idea. And finally, you have geographic distribution. Where do Jews live? Isn't that interesting? Wouldn't that be interesting to know? Yes. 43% of American Jews live in the Northeast. So we're talking Philadelphia. I don't know if they count Washington, D.C. as the Northeast or not, but certainly Philadelphia, Boston, New York, um, New England more broadly, uh, that would all count as Northeast. Only 11% are in the Midwest. Uh, we in Chicago are a small proportion of the American Jewish population. Um, only 23% uh, live in the South compared to 37% of the general population and a comparable population live in the West. About a quarter of American Jews and a quarter of the US population live in the West as well. But notice the commentary on the pros at the side. The vast majority of Jews live in either urban areas, 49%, or in the suburbs, 47%. Just 4% of US Jews live in rural areas compared to one in five Americans overall. So 20% of Americans as a whole live in rural areas, but only 4% of American Jews live in rural areas. Okay, so our next one is where they explored questions of Jewish identity. Um, and you'll notice at the top, they say six in 10 say being Jewish is mainly a matter of ancestry and culture, as we said, as we saw before. Um, how do Jews identify by denomination? How do they describe themselves? Well, 35% of all Jews identified as reform, 18% identified as conservative. Now, this is fascinating because if you went back 50 years ago, those numbers might have been flipped. The conservative movement was a much higher proportion of American Judaism, 30, 40%. Now it's down to 18% in this study and maybe even less in the next one. We'll have to see. But you'll notice that an appreciable number of those Jews of no religion still identify with a denomination like reform or conservative because of how they were raised, or if they had to go somewhere, they'd go there, but they don't really go anywhere. There's all kinds of other ways to fit this in. There's also other denominations, which is about 6%, and no denomination, just Jewish, culturally Jewish, agnostic, whatever, that's about 30%. So actually, the second largest denomination is none of the above, is no denomination at all. Um, I'll also point out that that orthodox number of 10%, has been relatively stable over the last several national Jewish surveys in America, where it was, I think, 9% in 1990, it was about 10% in um, uh, the 2000, 2001 study. This is about 10%. And people have been predicting for a long time that the Orthodox would overwhelm American Judaism because of all the kids that these families have. We noticed the fertility rate, right? 4.1 compared to uh, 1.8 or 1.9 in the reform and conservative uh, settings. But the proof is in the pudding in terms of how many people stay identified with that, with that identity. So um, they have a chart here. Uh, they have a chart in an earlier document that highlights the fact that Orthodox Jews don't always stay Orthodox. 
that is about half of the people who were raised Orthodox wind up identifying as some other variety of Jewish compared to those who are uh, raised conservative who may become more reformed. There are some conservative Jews who become more Orthodox and some reformed Jews that become conservative or Orthodox, but they're actually a much smaller number than people think. Um, it's a much uh, more common phenomenon to become more liberal and less traditional. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why um, the conservative movement has shrunk because younger Jews, in particular those who are intermarrying, don't have as comfortable a home in a conservative congregation um, as uh, they might in a reform congregation. It's beginning to change slowly, but as is often the case, the conservative movement changes much more slowly than the reform movement, where the reform movement was willing to accept the child of a Jewish father as Jewish without any kind of conversion in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, in fact, officially. Uh, the conservative movement is still having that conversation. And how willing are they to allow their rabbis to even attend an intermarriage, let alone officiate in some capacity, where reform rabbis have been able to do it, even if it's against their formal policy, there's been no punishment for them for a long time. Um, so it's, it's really been uh, reflected in that shift in denomination where you see um, of those who identify with the denomination, reform is much larger, and people suspect that's in large part because of the both secularization process and because of the results of pushing away those who choose to uh, marry someone who's not Jewish. How important is being Jewish in your life? Is it very, somewhat, not at all? You don't know? Again, ask yourself how you might answer that question. Overall, for Jews, 46% said it's very important in their life. 34% said, it, 34 said it's somewhat important, and 20% 20 said not that important or not at all important. Uh, it's who they are, but not a big part of who they are. Um, you'll notice these numbers shift by age cohort. If you're Jewish by religion, it's a little bit higher. If you are a Jew of no religion, where they're still Jewish, but don't identify as Jewish uh, religiously um, or, you know, as an easy answer, it's sort of a second or third tier down answer, as we saw in the flowchart. Notice that being Jewish is not too important to them or maybe not at all important to them. Again, denominationally, you'll notice that uh, it's higher on the list for Orthodox and conservative Jews. It's more middling for Reformed Jews or no denomination Jews. And again, a chunk of the no denomination say it's not that important to them. But asking the question differently, are you proud to be Jewish? 94% are proud to be Jewish. But notice, 46% said it's very important to them, but 94% are proud to be Jewish. So they might not do a lot of Jewish, but they are proud to be Jewish. And those 90% numbers run all the way down the line. You'll notice even conservative and reform Jews score in the 90% uh, and score very highly on have a sense of strong sense of belonging to the Jewish people. Um, and even on having a sense of special responsibility to care for Jews in need. That's in the 60% uh, for, and up to the 80%. Um, and, uh, you know, that's very high across the board. Now, here's that question we saw before about is being Jewish mainly a question of ancestry or culture or religion or both religion and ancestry or religion and culture. Um, again, you'll notice the numbers are generally in the high 60s on ancestry and culture all the way down. Um, although you'll notice the Orthodox Jews are more likely to say it's primarily a matter of religion. And it's the conservative and the reform and the no denomination Jews who are much more likely to say it's ancestry or culture or a combination of the two. But we are the vast majority. Again, the Orthodox represent 10% in this 2013 study. Then they asked, what's essential to being Jewish? This is the doing Jewish question. You know, what are things you do that should be part of your expressing your Jewishness? And the answers to this are both hilarious and sad It's in, in different ways of looking at it. Remembering the Holocaust is seen to be a very important thing. Leading an ethical and moral life is high on the list for both cultural Jews and religious Jews. Working for justice and equality is over 50%. Being intellectually curious outscores caring about Israel. Having a good sense of humor far outscores being part of a Jewish community. And observing Jewish law or eating traditional Jewish foods is way down on the list of what's essential to being Jewish compared to having a sense of humor, being intellectually curious, and working for justice or equality, none of which are uniquely Jewish because you can be non-Jewish and be funny, you can be non-Jewish and be curious, and you can be non-Jewish and work for justice and equality, let alone leading an ethical and moral life. So it's really fascinating to see that the distinctively Jewish things sometimes score lower 
than the universal things that we think of as being part of our Jewishness. Um, and then this breaks it out by age cohort and so on. There's, uh, again, you can get very granular in the data. data. Now, in terms of defining boundaries, of course, it's not just a question of what the demographers say counts as someone who is Jewish, but it's also what the Jews themselves say is compatible with being Jewish. So they ask, is it compatible if a person is Jewish and they work on the Sabbath? 94% say yes, fine, no problem. 5% still have an issue with that. What if they're strongly critical of Israel? Well, that's a little bit more of a red line for some people, but again, 89% say, sure, you can be Jewish if you're strongly critical of Israel. What if they don't believe in God? The question humanistic Jews have gotten for 50 plus years, how can you be Jewish if you don't believe in God? 68% of American Jews say someone can be Jewish if they don't believe in God. So we have two thirds of the people on our side, but one third of the people still have trouble with you know, secular Jews of any variety. Now, the last question is a really interesting one. Can you be Jewish if you believe Jesus was the Messiah? Well, I know a lot of Jews who would say, what? Of course not. But 34% of this study said yes, because if Jewishness is primarily a matter of ethnicity and uh, ancestry, that you can be Jewish by ancestry and believe Jesus was the Messiah. So interesting details about how other people draw the line, but also, again, how you might answer these question, questions and draw the lines. And again, denominational splits on these um, are sometimes predictable. Uh, but believing Jesus was the Messiah, again, you'll notice the numbers are much smaller, but even 35% of Orthodox Jews say a person can be Jewish if they believe Jesus was the Messiah, because from the Orthodox perspective, they're Jewish because they were born Jewish. Their mother is Jewish. Their mother doesn't stop being Jewish if they decide something silly like Jesus was the Messiah. After all, there are plenty of Lubavitcher Jews who think Menachem Mendel Schneerson was the Messiah, <laughs> and they still are accepted as Jewish. Notice, though, that the numbers actually go down for conservative and reformed Jews who are less likely to allow you to believe Jesus was the Messiah than Orthodox Jews who are following at least the consistent matrilineal definition there. Um, although, again, a majority of them would say no. Still, the numbers are a little bit higher there. Interesting uh, circumstance. Okay. Are you a participant in Jewish causes or organizations? This is where the rubber hits the road. Do you actually join anything or do anything with the organized Jewish community? Again, the numbers here are fascinating. Are you a member of a synagogue? 31% of all the Jews surveyed said they are a member of a synagogue. That means 69% are not members. Are they members of other Jewish organizations? Another 18%. So that would be a total of 49% who are part of a Jewish community center or a Jewish book group or the National Council for Jewish Women or Hadassah or some other kind of organization. And 56% made a donation to some kind of Jewish organization. But notice even Jews by religion, 39% are members of synagogues, but again, a majority are not members of synagogues. 67% of them, however, made donations to Jewish organizations. Of the age cohort, again, the younger ones are less likely to be members than older ones. That's predictable. Higher incomes are more likely to be members than lower incomes, given the due structure in most congregations. That's also predictable. If your spouse is Jewish, 60% of those whose spouse is Jewish are members, but only 14% of those spouse who is not Jewish are members. Now, the chicken and egg question the Jewish demographers ask is, is that because the non-Jewish spouse makes them not be a member? Or is it because they have a non-Jewish spouse that the synagogues don't welcome them as members? Which is the cause and which is the effect? Now, you'll notice that 69% of Orthodox Jews say they're members of a synagogue. But notice, that means maybe a little bit less than a third of Orthodox, self-identified Orthodox Jews are not officially members of a synagogue. They do it on their own. About 50% of conservative Jews, only a third of Reformed Jews say they're members of a synagogue. So this is a sea change. If you went back again 50 years, you would have found the majority of American Jews as members of synagogues. And so now that is the minority experience. And the ripple effects of that in organized Jewish community um, and in bar and bar mitzvah experiences and all kinds of other uh, 
uh, key questions for Jewish identification remain to be seen, but we're going to see the ripple effects of that over time. They even asked about Jewish friendship ne networks, what percent of your close friends are Jewish? Um, about a third said all or most, 20% said hardly any or none, and the balance of about 50% was somewhere in the middle. Um, again, it shifts a little bit by whether you're in the Northeast versus in the West. In the Far West, by the way, notice very few Jews say all or most, and the majority say some or hardly any. It's a much more dispersed experience living as a Jew out in the West. They also asked about, do you know the Hebrew alphabet? Only about half of Jews know the Hebrew alphabet, and half said they don't know. Uh, can they have a conversation in Hebrew? Only 12%. So think about the massive failure of our Hebrew schools, where you've got a huge cohort of people who learned how to read, but have no idea what they're saying, because they can't have a conversation in Hebrew. And even if you add up the, the sort of conversation that's 17%, that means another 35% or a full third of those who went to Hebrew school and learned the alphabet have no idea what they're saying. So that's sad <laughs> in many ways. Now, I'll be honest, I don't know that our students coming out of our program would be more than sort of have a conversation. And we focus on Hebrew as a language, not just as reciting prayers, but we get them one day a week for a few years. You know, uh, There's only so much you can do in that framework of Jewish education. Um, and so this talks more about uh, how, uh, whether you people converted or were they raised Jewish and so on which we're gonna uh, move forward uh, past that for now. And how are children being raised? This is also one of those $64,000 questions the Jewish community always wants to know the answers to. Um, among those who are parents or guardians of minor children, here's how they're choosing to raise their children. So of all Jews, 59% are raising their kids as Jewish by religion. 14% said they're raising it partly Jewish by religion. 8% said they're raising it Jewish not by religion, that is Jewish as culture or some kind of mixed, which could be Jewish and something else, multi-faith, et cetera. And 18% are not raising the kids Jewish at all, of the whole Jewish population. Now you'll notice Jews by religion are much more likely to raise their kids as by religion, but some of them are raising them partly Jewish or culturally. Jews of no religion, about 30% are raising them as uh, some variety of Jewish, but two thirds of them are not raising them as Jewish. Uh, and then, of those whose spouse is Jewish, a large proportion are raising their kids as Jewish by religion. Of those whose spouse is not Jewish, this is actually record high numbers for these. Because if you add up Jewish by religion, partly Jewish by religion and Jewish not by religion or mixed, you get over 60% of the children of intermarried parents are getting raised some variety of Jewish. And that's only because of the last 30 years of work trying to get the Jewish community to open and welcome intercultural families more. It's also because the broader population is secularizing and the non-Jews, these Jews are marrying, are much more secularized. And so they're not taking the kids to church because they don't go to church. So there's less competition on Sunday morning, so to speak. If they decide they want to raise the kids something, they might just choose to raise a Jewish because the non-Jewish partner may not be identified as a Christian anymore. But you'll also notice that 20% uh, of those who call themselves reform are raising their kids partly Jewish by religion, and 9% are raising it Jewish not by religion at all, or some kind of mixed. And then this also talks about what kind of educational programs they're sending the kids into. So what do Jews actually believe in America? Well, how important is religion in your life? We saw how important is Judaism. The numbers were somewhat surprising. Only 25% said it's very important here. 29% say somewhat important. But here we have the U.S. general public. Hopefully you can see that at the bottom of this chart. For Jews, 26% say religion is very important in their life. For the general U.S. public, 56% say it's generally important in their life. For self-identified Christians, 69% say it's very important in their life. Of Jews saying it's not at all important, religion is just not important to them at all, or not too important, 44% of Jews say that only 20% of the general population, only 8% of those who call themselves Christian say religion is not that important. So the general world is much more religious than the Jewish world. The Jewish world is much more secularized. In fact, if you want to find a parallel for us, you got to look at the unaffiliated people, because of them, for them, 18% say religion is important compared to 26 for us. 23% uh, 
say it's somewhat important compared to 29 for us. And where we're 44% not that important, it's 59% for the unaffiliated. We're much more like unaffiliated than we are like any other religious group. What about belief in God? 34% of American Jews believe in God or universal spirit. And I actually like the way this question is framed because it gives you the option of God or some other vocabulary if you don't like the word God. It also gives the option of absolutely certain, maybe not certain, and do not believe. So if you have the option for I don't know, do not believe is a stronger statement. And notice 23% of American Jews said they do not believe. And only 34% are absolutely certain. Look at the general public. 69% are absolutely certain. Only 7% do not believe. So we are much more secularized in belief as well as the statement of how important religion is. If you go down to those unaffiliated people, that's where we really are almost exactly the same. 30% of unaffiliated religious people are absolutely certain compared to 34 for us. 38% believe but are not certain exactly the same as the Jewish number. And 27% of unaffiliated do not believe compared to 23%. So we are almost exactly on the belief question like those unaffiliated with mainstream religions. We are a very secularized population. The same thing is true for attendance at religious services. So do you attend at least once a week, once or twice a month, a few times a year like the high holidays? 22% of American Jews never attend services, not even high holidays. But let's look at that compared to the general population here. 23% of Jews attend at least monthly, 50% of the general population attends monthly. A few times a year seldom is 54% for Jews. It's only 36% for the general public. 22% of us never attend, 13% of them never attend, and only 5% of self-identified Christians say they never attend services compared to 22% of self-identified Jews. Now, what you notice about this survey is how much they're privileging a religious sense of Jewishness. Even that first question, are you Jewish by religion? That was the first sorting line, where if you'd asked the question differently and started with the ethnicity questions, you might have had very different reactions further down the flowchart and further down these kind of questions as well. What kind of Jewish practices do Jewish do, Jews do? 70% participated in a Seder, 53% fasted for Yom Kippur, but only 23% always or usually light Shabbat candles, 22% keep kosher in the home, and only 13% avoid handling money on the Sabbath. But you notice those numbers are much higher denominationally for the Orthodox compared to conservative, where it's less, and reform where it's much less because those aren't part of their sense of Jewish identity. But doing a Passover Seder, even fasting on Yom Kippur, those are both important symbols. But notice Passover is even higher because it happens in the home. Um, it doesn't happen in a synagogue setting. It involves positively eating food instead of choosing not to eat food. <laughs> There's all kinds of attractions why Passover might be more done than uh, fasting on Yom Kippur. Um, they also ask questions about mixing faith traditions. One third of Jews including a quarter of Jews by religion, said they had a Christmas tree last year. Now, it could have been for their spouse, but they did it. And a smaller percentage attend religious services a few times a year. Here again, you'll see reflected that the Christian partners in these mixed faith households are much more about the Christmas tree in the home than they are about the religious service in the church or the mosque or the uh, Hindu temple or something. So I want to jump forward now to the uh, last section, which has to do with... Um, social and political views, because that again has an interesting insight into the American Jewish population. So party and ideology. 70% of American Jews call themselves Democrat or lean Democratic. The vast majority actually are solidly Democrats, where 22% identify as Republicans, including 13% uh, full and 8% leaning and so on. Um, and then 8% are independent or some other preference. Liberal moderate again, You've got 49% liberal, 29% moderate, only 19% conservative. Now you'll notice the Jews by religion are slightly more conservative and the Jews of no religion are more liberal. But again, notice the difference with the general public. 70% of all Jews are Democrat or lean Democratic, where it's 49% of the general population and similarly reversed for um, Republicans and even for independents or non-aligned. And same thing for liberal, moderate, conservative, 
double the proportion are conservative in the general public compared to the Jewish population. Now, when you break this down by different categories, it makes sense. For example, college graduates tend to be more liberal. That maps out. But notice the denominational split here. 36% of Orthodox Jews identified as Democrat or lean Democrat, where 57% identified as Republican. Whereas conservative and reform and no denomination Jews, the vast majority are Democrat or lean Democrat. But notice the flip there for the Orthodox population being much more likely to identify as both conservative on the ideology question and Republican on the party question. Um, and my guess is these numbers have only ex uh, gotten more extreme in the Trump era. Um, and we'll see that again when the study comes out uh, that was done, uh, uh, conducted in 2020 last year. Um, and fortunately, everybody was home to answer their phones. So maybe they got really good results from that 2020 study. Again, notice the general population, uh, the numbers are uh, very different from the Jewish population, but the split among Orthodox and the non-Orthodox Jews in terms of party and ideology uh, is very striking and something that we see reflected as well in um, Jewish communal dynamics. Um, Jews, are they registered to vote? Well, large numbers of them are registered to vote and certain to vote. Uh, compared to the general population, again, 74% is not bad, uh, but uh, the Jewish population is much higher in that category and a much smaller percentage are not at all registered to vote. Obama's job performance, remember this was done in 2013. 65% uh, of American Jews uh, approve of his performance and even higher number of Jews of no religion, uh, younger Jews more likely to approve than the older ones. But again, notice the flipped numbers in the Orthodox population, 54% disapprove compared to 33% approve, compared to conservative and reform, where over 60% of both approve and only 30% disapprove. So a really wide split there. Um, and again, discussing uh, issues and how he handled these issues, um, approval of the economy, nation's policy toward Israel, dealing with Iran. Again, the orthodox disapproval numbers are much higher. The approvals are lower among conservative and reform. The approvals are much, much higher, even though the Iran question it was a much more uh, divisive issue and remains so in the organized Jewish community. On social issues, uh, homosexuality and the question of uh, the uh, size of government. Here's again where you might see why the Orthodox populations identify as much more conservative and Republican. So overall, uh, should this be accepted or discouraged by society or neither? 82% of American Jews say it should be accepted and should not be discouraged. Only 13% say it should be discouraged. Um, notice Jews of no religion are even more secular on that question, both men and women at 80% or higher. Uh, college graduates, almost 90%. Um, Republicans versus Democrats, even a majority of Republican Jews would accept uh, homosexuality in society and would not discourage it. But then notice again, the denominational split. Orthodox Jews, only 32% say it should be accepted and 58% disapprove including an even higher proportion of the ultra-Orthodox compared to conservative and reformed Jews who are in the 80s or 90s on acceptance and very small numbers on rejection. And again, notice how different we are from the general public where the Jewish total, 82% accepted, only 57% of the general population, only 13% of American Jews discourage it, where 36% of the general population discourage it and even higher among other religious groups. So uh, again, you'll see we are very much like the unaffiliated here. The unaffiliated in the general population, 83% support compared to 82, discouraging 13% compared to 13%, it's almost identical. What about the size of government? This is again, often a proxy for liberal or conservative. Well, Jews as a whole, 54% prefer more government, bigger services compared to 38%, but it's, it's a closer split because remember there's a proportion of Jews who are moderate liberals, uh, you know, not all the way on the liberal end, they're on the moderate side of that scale. Um, and again, you'll notice the Orthodox uh, would say prefer uh, bigger government. No, they prefer a smaller government because they don't want the government telling them what to teach in their schools or um, uh, you know, how to handle their gay kids and uh, continuing to promote conversion therapy and all kinds of other issues like that, where uh, the reform movement is the uh, higher audience for wanting larger government services. But even there, the numbers are much more tepid than you'd think for the overwhelming democratic support that the liberal Jewish denominations provide, they're less willing to support a bigger government and more services compared to a smaller government and fewer services. Um, do you have a positive view of your neighborhood? Are you satisfied with where the country's going? 
Um, again, in 2013, there was a lot of dissatisfaction, but that was comparable to the general public, a little bit slightly more satisfied, but that's about it. And then in asking, are Jews discriminated against um, uh, compared to other people? Uh, and also, um, is there, uh, there are, is there a lot of discrimination against each of these groups? Are you willing to accept that there's discrimination against gays and lesbians? American Jews were very willing to accept that, even more so than the general population against Muslims, more so than the general population against Blacks, more so than the general population against Hispanics, against, against Jews. Jews were more likely to think there was discrimination against them than uh, the general population. But notice, 54% of American Jews said no, there isn't really a lot of discrimination against Jews these days. Interesting analysis there. Is there discrimination against atheists? A lot of people say no. Uh, again, remember, American Jews are living in urban or suburban settings. They're not living in rural settings where you would experience that the most. Um, and so uh, that's one of those areas where our setting influences our politics and our perception of whether people are persecuted against or not. And did they have personal experiences with discrimination? Again, a relatively small number have been personally called offensive names or uh, snubbed in a social setting compared to what we might expect that number to be um, if society were as anti-Semitic as certain organizations trying to raise money would lead you to believe. Well, so this is a whirlwind tour through the American Jewish population through the lens of this particular study, which is a snapshot in time with its particular issues and agenda. Uh, but I think it gives you a, a nice framework to understand where Jews live, what their earning proportion is, what their education levels are, what some of the important issues are to their community, how they relate to each other, and how they differ from each other. And uh, whether we're one community or several communities uh, remains, up, remains to be seen. And there's a number of interesting trends that I just want to end with in terms of looking forward to the release next week of the 2020 study. Um, it'll be very interesting to see, for example, where those uh, intermarriage numbers go. Um, and the raising of children of intermarriage with some kind of Jewish identity, I think will be up because things have only gotten better in the organized Jewish community since that 2013 study. There are all kinds of new initiatives, whether it's PJ Library, which is free books for families or uh, Jewish outreach programs, something called Honeymoon Israel, trying to reach out to recently married couples, congregations being more welcoming, more rabbis willing to do weddings. I mean, there's all kinds of positive steps that have been done. So I think that number will be up. Um, and the number of intermarried families identifying with some kind of Jewish community may be higher um, than we saw before. Um, the Jewish affiliation rate may still go down simply because that was the trend and that trend may continue. Um, that may change after the pandemic when people feel a need for community. They may find uh, more people coming to congregations and more congregations changing their due structures to be welcoming and inclusive as Kohadash has. Uh, we may also find that the total number of Jews has actually gone up. We're used to hearing the Jewish number go down because people think of intermarriage as a dead end. Once they married someone out, forget it, it's over. But the more children of intermarriage identifying as Jewish, and I get a lot of them, by the way, coming to me to do their wedding because they want a rabbi at the wedding, even if they had one parent that was Jewish and one parent that wasn't, they're choosing a Jewish connection for their family going forward. Um, so there may be many more Jews who identify as Jewish because the loss rate has decreased and the retention rate is going up. Um, I'm really interested to see that denominational question. Um, the people who were raised Orthodox, are they still leaving in large numbers or are they doing a better job at retention in that community? Um, are Jews actually becoming more traditional um, or are they simply moving laterally? Are those people leaving the conservative movement becoming more reform or are they becoming what's called non-denominational and they're part of what are called independent minyanim and prayer circles? So they're still actively Jewish in a traditional vein, but they're not part of any denominational category. Maybe the denominations themselves are beginning to fade away in favor of flavors or styles, or a spectrum instead of A, B, C, or D. We just don't fit in those silos as easily anymore. And of course, the top line number for us that will be fascinating is Jews of no religion. How many are there? And what proportion are they? And what do they do? And uh, how do we find them? And how do we teach them about what we do in humanistic Judaism? so that they might decide that we are better than being nothing. Because I like to say, this is one of our joke slogans, we're better than nothing. We're not just better than 
you know, nothing, but we're better than being nothing, than doing nothing, than having no community. And uh, we find meaning out of finding like-minded people and hopefully other Jews of no religion or cultural Jews or secular Jews, whatever label they put on them in this survey, will also find us as a warm and welcoming home for them. Well, so I noticed, obviously, it didn't say humanistic in, in any of the categories. We're not there as a choice. But that's why it's, I'm very curious to see what the new, um, how it was done this time. Also, because so, there's so much that isn't reflected. And I think about all the stuff that we do. So we, as individuals who are very involved, let's say, in Kol Hadash or humanistic Judaism, like you, like me, but... Uh, it doesn't really, the survey is sort of showing, you know, if you're an atheist, then that sort of goes along with not being very involved. There weren't as enough choices in under like practices and traditions that you do. Right. What about if you have a whole bunch of, you know, there's so many other ways to form community that don't fit any of that, that right. people do, and it might be a strong Jewish tie. So it's interesting, and I don't know how they pick what they're going to do. Yeah, uh, I mean, there are, uh, these are sort of the summary reports. Sometimes they'll ask more questions, like they might ask about Hanukkah candles and a Passover Seder and uh, reading Jewish newspapers or listening to Jewish music. Or, you know, they might ask some of those more cultural questions. Um, it just depends on, you know, which report we're presenting. This is sort of the overall headline survey. They might have got, they had a sub-report on Jewish practices where they detailed those more uh, clearly. Um, I mean, for us, the top line number is actually um, not just the Jews of no religion category, which is about one fifth of the overall population, uh, because the way they asked it, I find very convoluted, you know, mm -hmm. to start with, uh, are you Jewish by religion? There's going to be a lot of people who might be like us who fit in that category, you know, because they just say, yeah, I'm Jewish by religion. You know, that if I'm filling out a survey, I click category Jewish because that's what that's where I fit. You know, uh, they don't often offer Jewish as an ethnicity, you know, as something to fill out on a survey. So they might have said Jewish by religion when they're really more cultural. When they asked the do you or not believe in God, and they had the option of yes, maybe, or no, 23% saying, no, I do not believe in God. That was really interesting. And that population might be more amenable to a humanistic Jewish message. Although some of those people who don't believe go to synagogue. And some of those people who never go to synagogue believe. You know, it's not a neat map of they're all the same people here because there are non-believers in pews at synagogues because they go because they have a friend there or they like the rabbi or they like the view of Lake Michigan from out of the window um, or whatever the, the, the variable might be. And um, we, uh, you know, so our appeal is going to be hitting a little of this niche, a little of that, that, that niche and so on. Uh, but you're right, how they ask the questions and who they ask them to is uh, really makes a big difference. And I also, I wanted to start with highlighting the numbers. They only talked to 678 Jews of no religion. That's, you know, that was the raw number that they wound up completing the interviews with. And only about, I think, 1,700 uh, Jews by religion. So, I mean, I know it's a lot of work, and I, I don't envy them calling 70,000 people to try to get, you know, 2,500 completed interviews here. Um, but, you know, it, you could really skew those numbers. You, you hit a clutch of, you know, re Reconstructionist Jews, and you're going to get a whole very different answer for a particular population. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how they approach that question of finding Jews for this latest survey. Um, I actually was part of a meeting of the uh, Chicago Board of Rabbis um, with some of the consultants for the uh, uh, this study. And we talked through with them those questions of cell phones. And, and also, by the way, uh, if you're finding Jews just by last names in a phone book, because Certainly, if you have intercultural families that get married and take on names like Ratnaswamy, <laughs> um, or you have people who choose to identify as Jewish and come with not Jewish names in their conversion process, um, you know, you're not going to find them in the old-fashioned ways. The Jewish community is a lot more diverse now than it was before, and it's going to require a lot different ways of finding these self-identified Jews. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what they manage to find. I Again, I couldn't, I, I wish I had, you know, scheduled this program in two weeks and I would have had the, the 2020 results handy, but this at least gives you a framework of understanding where we were in 2013 to be able to compare it and understanding what they're talking about in terms of categories to understand um, how it fits in and how you might fit into those categories. Please.
Um, I wonder um, whether the um, uh, reported rise in anti-Semitism will be reflected in, in the new uh, survey. Yes, that number of, did you have personal experience or not, might be higher, that's true. Um, and what's your perception of how much Jews are discriminated against? You know, I, it was a oh, majority said that Jews were not discriminated against. Maybe that number will be higher. Um, but I'm not positive because uh, I do know there are Jews in Charlottesville. Um, in fact, we have uh, members of our national movement who are in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, but there's not a lot of Jews in Charlottesville. And there are a lot of Jews in New York City. And there are a lot of Jews in Chicago, and there are a lot of Jews in Jewish areas and Jewish neighborhoods and Jewish suburbs who are very unlikely to hear that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I could ask my kids if they've ever heard any kind of anti-Jewish uh, rhetoric or had an experience like that in their school experience. My guess would be no, um, or very rare. Um, and if anything, it might have come from other Jewish students, like, you know, Playing, uh, playing with language with each other. Um, but I, I highly doubt they would have had like a, a very strongly anti semitic I mean, the, the hullabaloo from the school district and the parent you know, cohorts in Highland Park specifically would be through the roof. I would have heard about it. Um, they might find it on the internet, that's true, as somebody comments. Um, but uh, in terms of personal interaction, it's unlikely. Um, where, you know, uh, you might find it elsewhere. But you get cities like New York, you get a very diverse population. I mean, it's been really shocking to me to see um, a number of these attacks on Asian people, particularly Asian women, um, have been uh, have been done by African-American men and women, this latest attack with a hammer. Um, and there's a lot of tension within minority communities. It's not just white populations that are oppressing all people of color equally. Um, and so uh, it depends on where you live and who your neighbors are and what their issues are. Uh, there was a case just uh, last year in Philadelphia where the head of the NAACP in Philadelphia uh, tweeted out the most obnoxious anti-Semitic image um, that he said, uh, I mean, he was trying to defend it even after it was posted. To their credit, the national NAACP removed him from his position. There was a whole clergy alliance um, across denominations who were uh, telling him he was wrong and he had to leave. It was a really nice moment of solidarity um, for the organized communities of both uh, Blacks and Jews and Black Jews as bridges and all kinds of groups working together. Um, but the fact that it happened was really disconcerting. Um, so I think you're right that um, the rise of more visible anti-Semitism, particularly on the internet, uh, would have stronger numbers in response to that. Um, but the problem with some of the anti-Semitism surveys is they'll say, have you heard of anyone who had an issue with something like this? And then they report them all and don't zero them out for doubles. You know, so they'll ask on a campus, have you heard of someone who had an issue like this? And it could be two issues. But if that those two people have the same 30 friends who answer the survey, it sounds like 60 issues, <laughs> you know, because, because the, the same thing is being reported multiple times. So it'll be interesting to see how those numbers come out. I think you're right that they will be higher. Um, but I don't think they'll be uh, as high as people have feared, um, simply because of, you know, the uh, urban uh, setting. And, and Victoria points out as well, how recent was the issue, or have you ever heard this at any point in your life? You know, then, again, the older you are, the more likely it's just going to add up. At some point, you'll run into some jerk. I mean, I can think back to when I was in uh, middle school, I went to a tennis camp, and I hit a shot that hit the net and barely dribbled over, you know, as happens. Um, and the person across from me said, oh, that's a Jew shot. And I pointed out to him, this was, uh, that was a problem. But it, and he had just never thought about it as, you know, that's just what he'd always heard people say. Uh, so I, I would count, I haven't heard anything in, you know, probably 40 years <laughs> in my life. But, you know, if it was an ever thing, then that would have to count in the, uh, in the list.